I am truly living proof that we are not promised tomorrow. And so if we know that we never know what's going to happen at any instant to our family, ourselves, our jobs, that's not a reason to live scared. It's a reason to live fully. Hey, it's Renee. Welcome to the Into the Wild show, the podcast for women who want to build incredible mental strength to level up their business and lifestyle. I'm Renee Warren, the founder of We Wild Women, author, speaker, award-winning entrepreneur, and your host. Together, we will make you unapologetic about shining your light, growing your business, and turning you into a wildly confident and successful leader. This is for you, the visionary, the go-getter, the entrepreneur, and for those that need a real kick in the butt to get going and to dream bigger. Each week, I bring in leading experts and entrepreneurs to help you take leaps in the right direction because I know the best advice comes from someone who has successfully done it before. So are you ready to level up? Welcome to Into the Wild. Hey, you wild women. In 2019, after an unexpected loss, just five days after she returned from a whirlwind trip to France with her husband, Bevan founded the Take the Damn Chance movement and created the Do the Damn Thing method. Her D-A-M-N, damn, framework has inspired thousands to connect with people that they love, to do the crazy thing that makes all the difference, and when given a choice, to take the damn chance. She is the author of Your Damn Manifesto, Discover the Keys to Personal Transformation and Bringing Your Biggest Dreams to Life, and is a coach that supports women in achieving their goals, even after going through deep, challenging experiences. In this episode, Bevan and I chat about what she views as the personal vision of success and how to uncover your yes and start on the path to bringing it to life. We touched on practical tips, expert advice, and empowering insights to help you shape your own definition of success with no excuses. No excuses. By the end, you will feel ready to actually start doing the damn thing. Please welcome the incredible Bevan Ferrand. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation. Me too, because we have a lot of good damn things to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to say the word damn more than you have in your entire life in the next 30 minutes. (laughs) I know, even beyond that, I feel like that's going to be the theme word for the day is damn, damn, damn. And I feel like it's one thing we allow our kids here to say. Actually, we have a rule about swearing in our household because my kids are 10 and 11 and they know the words. They're allowed to use them with discretion in our house as long as there's nobody else around, but not in public. We're allowed to sing them, not say them, because they'll be singing a song. And I'm like, well, you can sing that, but not say it. But my kids now, my daughter, my oldest is six and a half, and she was in preschool. She ran in and she goes, Miss Jasmine, I got my damn t-shirt in my backpack <laughs> because she had to take the damn trip t-shirt. So... <laughs> That's I had awesome. to explain to the principal what I do. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Damn's not the bad word, but I like that. We can sing them, not sing. Because I know like sitting in the car sometimes and it's like we have a drive to school playlist that we listen to every single morning and we always jam out and they're swear words. And they look at me, they're like, the word's coming up and they're like, Ugh. and I'm like, just, just let it out. And they scream the swear word out louder than any other part of the song. And I'm like, you know what? Let it out now, baby. We're in a safe place in a car. Just us. Like, do what you got to do. Sing it, not say it. Now you know. When you get to school, (laughs) none of that. Yeah. (laughs) Like, cut it out. You are a perfect, respectable child. (laughs) Um, Okay, we got a lot of great things to talk about, though, because you had some wild rides in your life, which I know some listeners can relate to. And I don't want to say that they're unfortunate circumstances. They are. However... You're a shining example of taking the hardship in life and turning it into a purpose and being of service to others. And I love that about you. And there's a reason why I wanted you on my show. So explain to us a little bit about who you are and what you do. And why I say the word damn all the time. (laughs) Take the damn stage. (laughs) Well, the story really starts back in 2019. On Mother's Day, my husband, Mark, surprised me with tickets to France for my 40th birthday. He gave me four bottles of Bordeaux wine because that's the type of parents we were and tickets to France. And it was going to be in six months. We had some planning to do, but we had two young children. We had a four-month-old and a two-year-old. Two weeks after that, I went in for a promotion and I got let go. 
So all of a sudden, we had just taken money out of our savings so I could take a full three-month maternity leave with our four-month-old. We'd bought a new van. We were not expecting this at all. And about two weeks after that, we were out walking on our country roads. And I said to Mark, I don't want to look for a job. This is the third time in under 10 years that I've lost my job for one reason or another. And I don't want to put the financial health of our family into the hands of one person ever again. I wanted to start a business doing everything I'd been doing for 10 years with large seven and eight figure businesses doing digital strategy, launch management, brand direction. But I wanted to do it for small businesses and entrepreneurs who wanted to grow their business to six and seven figures. And Mark was an engineer, so I could feel his little engineer brain exploding in his head. (laughs) But we said, let's just do a proof of concept and see if we can, if I can make $5,000 by the end of August. So I made $0 in June and $1,000 in July. And I hit my $5,000 mark in August. And by the time we were ready to leave for our trip, which was totally crazy because we were going to be in planes the same amount of time we were on the ground. But by the time we left, I had made $35,000 in my business. So we were like, okay, we can we can take this trip, even though it seems absolutely crazy. And I asked him if we should cancel it the day before. We went to Bordeaux and had this amazing trip, the two of us just exploring a city neither of us had ever been in, eating delicious food, drinking incredible wine, and really reconnecting to who we were as a couple before we had kids, before we got married, before the stress of the jobs. And Mark looked at me at one point and he said, I feel like I'm reconnecting to the real you. We came back home and it was the week of Thanksgiving, which is my favorite holiday. And he had taken the whole week off work. So we got ready around the house. We took our daughter to her first movie theater show. It was pre-pandemic, so we had 25 people coming in, Mark's parents, my family. And the day after Thanksgiving, I went upstairs to wake up Mark, and he wasn't breathing. And he had passed away in the middle of the night, completely unexpectedly. We had no idea that he had undiagnosed heart disease. One of his arteries was 95% blocked, and the other was 50% blocked. Now, all of a sudden, I was the solo parent to two kiddos under the age of three, a sole financial provider with a very brand new business that had not yet stood the test of time. And I'm doing all of it without the love of my life and my best friend and my biggest cheerleader by my side. So about a month after that, I made a post on social media talking about losing Mark, talking about my birthday and the trip. And I ended it by saying, whenever you're faced with a choice, just take the damn trip. That really resonated with people. And I got so many messages from people saying, I took this trip with my dad right before he passed away and it meant the world to me. Or I was going to say no to this trip with my friends, but now I'm going to say yes. Or more importantly, people just saying to me that they were not going to keep pushing those big dreams to the side. And at that point, I started looking at the hardest things that I've been through because I didn't just lose my husband at 40. I lost my dad to cancer when I was 24. I lost my home in a house fire in 2010. My kiddos are IVF babies. So I went through years of fertility treatments and a miscarriage. Lost my job three times in 10 years. I looked at all those things, but I also looked at the most amazing things that I had created. So that business that was growing, having those kiddos, having this really amazing connected relationship with Mark. And I asked myself, what is it that I do differently, not better, but differently than other people to navigate these situations with some grace and creativity. And that is where the DAM framework started. So it does stand for something. I know we've been saying it (laughs) a lot in the last few minutes, but it stands for decide and declare, attend your own party, moments, not minutes, and now is the time. And from that, I created the take the damn chance movement, the do the damn thing method, And I have used it to, because once you see them, you can't unsee them. And I've used it to create some really incredible things, not just growing my business, but I went after my biggest dream to date and I had the damn baby. So I moved forward with IVF that Mark and I had been planning. And 20 months after Mark died, I gave birth to his and my daughter. So I now have three kiddos. Wow. Yeah. Six and a half, four and a half and two. And... Damn. Everything, yeah, <laughs> damn. <laughs> Making me cry. Everything <laughs> is all about do everything around this do the damn thing method in all the areas of my life. That is a very powerful story. Man, we call them SHIT sandwiches, but you got all of them. I did. 
<laughs> and you're like, all right, let me go do the next thing. That the word that kept coming up for me was resilience. That's the epitome of being like, this isn't happening to me in those moments. You definitely feel like it is, but you're like, this is happening for me. And the for me in my understanding of this is now you're of service to so many people that you've already inspired people to make that next move. See, and I don't actually say that it's happening for me. And I don't say that it's happening to me either. I just know that it happens. And one of the things, the A, is that we can't control what happens to us. We can only control how we respond. The same situation could happen. You know, I have three sisters. So we could have, when our dad passed, right? Somebody could think this happened to us and somebody else could think this happened for us. And I just think this thing happened and... I call it taking 100% radically loving responsibility for my role in the experience of my life, which means nobody's ever going to convince me that my husband died for a good reason. And I can choose how I respond by how I share the stories with my kids, how I share our message with the world. That's how I respond to the fact that I lost this amazing man. It's true. Those perspectives are beautiful. I always think it's a gift because I believe in God and that everything is by design and that there's so many unfortunate things like we've all experienced in our lives. And sometimes like, how? what do you mean? This is detrimental to my life. This is the saddest thing that's ever happened to me. And there's a lot of crap. Believe me, I've seen it and I've been through a lot of it. However, just like you said, you can choose. You're at this fork in the road where you can decide that this is happening to you, which means you become the victim of your circumstances. Or you can choose that it's happening for you because it's kind of like that fuel to your engine to do something great, to be great. There's a book that I quote all the time. It's called The Five Regrets of the Dying. So the four of the five things, get this, were the things that people didn't do. Yes. Yes. It was the things that people didn't do. It it wasn't about anything else. It was what they didn't do in their life because our memories are served through experiences with other people and doing stuff that we are so passionate about. That was, and I haven't read that book either, but now I need to. That was the decision to have our youngest daughter, Miristella, when I thought about it. Because for me, the decision was very easy. We were about 60 days away from starting it before Mark passed away. And I've always known I wanted to be the mom of three. The decision to do it was easy. The execution took work. But the tipping point, the deciding factor was I said, if I don't do this, This is the thing that I will regret when I turn 75 and look back on my life and it will be the thing. And what I have learned is that nobody else will ever have to live with your regrets. Ooh, say that again. Nobody else will ever have to live with your regrets. And I think that we spend a lot of time unconsciously asking people for permission rather than support to kind of go after our dreams. We say things like, I want to start a business. Do you think that I should? Or I want to make a big move. That puts a lot of onus on the other person. It does. And that's the problem. They then try that idea on for themselves. And if they are at all uncomfortable, they will start eating away at your dream. Not because it's malicious, but because they care about you and they want to keep you safe and they don't want to see you get hurt. If instead we can shift it to, I'm doing this thing. I would love your support. If you're not comfortable with that, that's okay. That shifts it to their decision about whether or not to support you will not change your decision about whether or not to do it. That is so powerful. And that can be translated in everything in life, in your marriage and parenting and business, even with your relationship with yourself. Your health, everything. Because I mean, I think about this in PR, right? In pitching the media, in pitching podcast hosts, is the less onus and work you can put on the person you're pitching, the more likely it is to get a yes. So that means like your pitch is dialed in because you have a very clear call to action. I want to be a guest on your show and here's a topic that's missing that I think your audience would find powerful. I'd love to talk about this. Can't tell you how many times I get pitches and they're like, here's this person, they're great. Maybe they could be a podcast guest or maybe they can contribute an article or maybe you can interview them. It's like, well, what one is it? And all of a sudden the work's on me, I'm not interested. 
So when you're putting the onus on the other person, now they're stressed out because they're like, did I say the right thing? Am I punting this? Like, I want to see this person great, but I also don't want this to be my responsibility. It's so true because when I used to pitch podcasts, I would talk about my story first. I would say, look, I've been through this. And that was not always a good fit for a podcast. And they couldn't immediately see how it would benefit their listeners. And I know it's a powerful story. You emailed me, was it? Or was it an Instagram? Mm-hmm. No, I think we emailed you. Okay, I'm going to pull it up. I got to find yeah. you here. <laughs> I'm just smiling. I'm like, where did you email me? So keep talking, but I do want to. Okay, here's where you emailed me August 25th. Is that okay if I read this? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Okay. And anyone so, else who's listening who has a podcast, consider this a good pitch. Well, yeah. Well, there's, I mean, yes, good pitch in a way, but there's also, there's so many variations and, and elements that go into a pitch beyond the words in an email too. But the subject line is something that I wouldn't have approved. However, okay. yeah. it was very timely because you mentioned Nicole Bianchi. It was Nicole Bianchi episode. Essentially, it was like the previous episode that went out and this was like, oh no, was there an error? Is it not downloaded? Like for me, it's like, oh, there's a technical error. Or she has a compliment about the show. Like that was my immediate response. And then that wasn't it. <laughs> yeah, but it got you to open it. Yeah, and so like this all coming back to like taking the responsibility off someone else's play was, I'll go over this really quickly. Bevan Ferrand here. I host All the Damn Things, a podcast that is blah, blah, blah. Because you have a podcast, it's great. So then immediately to me, it's like, she has a podcast. I can assume that she's articulate and can tell a story. But then I'm like, but why is she in my inbox? I was just listening to your episode with Nicole and really enjoyed it. I love what you're doing with the show. You're hearing from me now because I was wondering if you're currently accepting guest pitches for Into the Wild. So it's like, there it is. She's like, is she accepting guest pitches? Is this going to be for her or is it for somebody else? And then you talk about, you think that listeners might love an episode about defining your own personal vision of success. You have a framework just one aspect of my new book called Your Damn Manifesto. Okay, so Bevan has a new book out called Your Damn Manifesto, <laughs> uh, which came out last month. And then I boomeranged it because I was like, I don't even, I think I was on vacation or something at this time. Oh no, you know what? That's what happened is we had been evacuated because of wildfires. So oh, I couldn't. So yeah. boomerang it means I'm bringing it back into my inbox. I had a time to think about it and it wasn't until September 2nd when I said, I'd love to have you on the show. But if you go through my program in terms of pitching, this wouldn't have been a 10 out of 10. But like I said, there's so many things that make a pitch a yes. It's also like, who is the person? I pitched one of my clients who has a significant following on social. She has over 100 million followers across her social channels. And the pitch that I pitched to Lewis Howes, which is one of the most notable podcasts in the world, would never follow my framework of what makes a good pitch. Why? Because this person's name is very notable and that in and of itself would probably get an open or some sort of conversation. Little did I know within like five minutes, it got a yes. And then for you, it's like, oh, this is cool. The thing, who is this woman? Okay, let me fit Bevan. Who is, okay, she's cool. And then I went to your social media to see what kind of content you're sharing. This is really crucial. I think I have a solo episode coming out next week about the importance of social media as kind of like your digital resume for your credibility. And I'm like, she's talking about this stuff. Yeah, okay, I want her on my show. But you took the work off my plate by saying, I love your show. This is what I want. Here's a book that I've published. Can I be a guest on your show? It was that simple. And I don't remember, did I even talk about my story in that, about losing my husband? I don't think so. Nope. So just because we're kind of talking about this in a meta way, that's in part of my follow-up pitch is, hey, just following up with this and here's a little bit more about my story. Because it's just, I think there's, for each of us, we have to look at like, what are the layers? And when we talk about social, I love that you brought that up because I grew, so I grew Collaborate.Work, my first company, to $300,000 in 18 months in the middle of the pandemic and while grieving the loss of my husband with less than a thousand social followers. And then scrapped it because that's what every good entrepreneur does. Totally. You know what? That's called throwing <laughs> grenades into your business. Just let it explode. <laughs> exactly. And went all in on Take the Damn Chance and grew that to $300,000 in 24 months while taking three months off to have Miristella. That's where I said, you know what? I need to be on social. I need to be sharing this message and I need to be sharing the message consistently because I do know that the message is powerful in all the different areas of our life. 
when I talk about the do the damn thing method, it's three steps. You craft your damn manifesto. That's what the book, the first book is about. You find your damn people and you get your damn results. And you can apply that to your business, your relationships, your parenting, your health, all these different areas. You just learn this framework and you focus on one area, you get it up and running, and then you circle right back around and you can do it on the next important area in your life. It's the thing I talk about all day, every day is this framework. So say the framework again, so we remove. So decide and declare, which is really like the key part of the damn manifesto in defining your own personal vision of success is uncovering your yes, the thing that you want more than anything else right now, and your six dimensional why. So that's the decide and declare. Attend your own party, which is really all about how we create our own experience through the filter of our thoughts and how we stay present in the moment, comparing ourselves only to ourselves and not to other people. Moments, not minutes, which is really about how the moments are so much more powerful. They're so much more important than the minutes and that we can create a moment at any instant. I was on Amy Porterfield's podcast and we talked about it being moments not to be missed. And we think of those best memories in our life or moments. Yeah. It's the reason when I say it, like I looked back at the hardest things, what created the M for me was when my dad had lung cancer, I went home to visit him. And while he was taking a nap, I went into the family lounge and I wrote him a letter about all of the important moments, just dancing with him at my sister's wedding, watching him get a pie in the face at his company picnic and fall back into a lake. Just these things, these moments. And I was going to mail it to him because it felt really awkward to hand it to him. But I said, you know, I'm just going to do that. So I handed it to him. I was like, dad, I just wanted you to have this. It's just some thoughts. I love you so much. I'll call you when I get home. I went home to Chicago. I talked to him on the phone and he was like, Bevan, thank you so much for this letter. This means the world to me. I love you so much. And that's the last time I talked to my dad because he passed away the next day. And I knew though, without a doubt, that he knew how much I loved him because I had shared all those moments with him. Man, you are giving me so many goosebumps. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love this. This is so, yeah. so powerful in all this. And it's bringing tears to my eyes too. I think about, I used to do coaching for entrepreneur couples. And this is almost a reminder for myself too, that for being with our kids, we think that we need to spend all of this time with them, all these hours with them. But they don't remember all the hours. They just remember what we call those micro moments. It's those accumulation of micro moments is what we all need for each other. It could be with your significant other or your father. It's not like, oh, let's just spend a whole entire weekend together and do everything. That's great. But it's those micro moments that matter the most. It's also important for us to remember that because if we've had a really terrible day with our kids where we didn't get enough sleep and they're cranky and we're snapping at each other, we can't, and my kids and I will sometimes do this where I'm like, okay, pause. I love you. Reset. And then I can create a moment. It's why when people will ask me, what's the ritual or routine I do every day? The only one I do is bedtime with my kids. I mean, every once in a while, I won't be there for it, but we do pajamas, brushing teeth. We go into my son's room and read stories. We go into my youngest's room and she goes to bed. And then my oldest daughter and I read a chapter book together and she goes to bed. And it is, it ends the day with a moment with each of them. And it's really important to me and it's important to them. My, our micro moments are the, are the drive to school because we have a playlist and that's when we get to sing our swear words. And I could just avoid that. It's like, they're just letting out that energy. And the music has something for the soul, right? It's so like healing. And they open that door and they leave for the day and they have a hop in their step. We love like the dance party. Like, oh, okay. What can we do right a now? A damn dance Let's party. dance party. The damn dance party. Oh, and so the end, I need to tell you the end. The end is now is the time. And that is, it's two things. One, it is getting into action through micro actions because there's never going to be a perfect day to get started. So then why not today? And we take micro actions in order to break the inertia and to get us first started. And the other part of it, and I think it's obvious when you hear my story, is that I am truly living proof that we are not promised tomorrow. And so if we know that we never know what's going to happen at any instant to our family, ourselves, our jobs, that's not a reason to live scared. It's a reason to live fully.
all this talk about doing the damn thing got me wondering, are you ready to invest in your damn self, (laughs) especially for 2024? So here's the thing is if you've listened to this show before, you've probably heard me talk about my program called the Authority Booster Intensive. I just finished one this week for a gentleman out of um, Idaho, and it has been so much fun. So the Authority Booster Intensive is so unique and different than what most other PR people are doing because it leverages my 13 years in the industry, creating a world-class PR strategy, a vetted media list of over 100 contacts, a very detailed media kit, which includes updated bio, interview questions, press release, if you're writing a book, book blurbs, and so much more. I also custom craft pitches for media and for podcasts. You get five to 10 of these, depending on the goal of what you're doing for PR. You get a detailed PR manual that ends up becoming your PR standard operating procedures. You get custom training videos, an hour long implementation call with me, access to me for a month and so much more. All this so that people that don't have the resources to invest in a retainer with a PR pro, that they can leverage world-class PR strategies and techniques that have been proven to get people incredible results. I love coming back to this example. My friend Callan implemented the PR VIP day and garnered almost $100,000 worth of revenue in a month because of the shows that she was on. And I've had so many clients come and be on top shows and they've actually leveraged the system for things outside of just pitching the media that have helped them grow their authority, their credibility, and their business. So if this is something you're thinking about to start and kick off 2024 with, I do have a couple of VIP days left in November and December. All you got to do is go to wewildwomen.com forward slash VIP day. So many people, they hesitate to go all in when presented with life-changing opportunities. What do you believe holds most individuals back from fully committing to a chance and how can they overcome these obstacles? I mean, there's so many layers to it. One is that permission versus support. We think we're looking for permission to go after our dream rather than the support. I think what has worked for me and what has worked for my clients is this idea of this damn manifesto. And that, like I said, it's the yes that you're willing to go all in on right now. So you're willing to make it your top priority and resource it and you're moving towards it rather than away from something else. But then also getting really clear on your six-dimensional why. Because people will often say, what's your why? Or, you know, Simon Sinek says, start with why. And it's so true. But we rarely go deep enough on it. And so I dive into, again, what I call the six-dimensional why, which is the six most important areas that are going to be impacted by our big dreams and the big changes in our lives. And those are financial, emotional, mental, physical, social, and spiritual. When you can tap into those areas, then it's easier to create your damn manifesto as a touchstone that you can go back to when things get hard. So what I mean by that is when I started Collaborate at Work, if I had just had this financial why of I want to replace the income that I just lost, I want to, you know, make more money, then in June when I made zero dollars, it would have been very easy for me to be like, I'm just going to go get a job that's easier. But if instead I can say, well, financially, I want to make more money. Emotionally, it'll make me really proud. Mentally, it'll provide challenges that I can solve. Physically, I get to work from anywhere. I get to travel. I get to be home with my kiddos. Socially, I'm making a difference in the world, a difference in the lives of my clients, but then rippling out. And then spiritually, like this, when I think about this now, this is really for my take the damn chance movement rather than collaborate at work. But spiritually, this is my soul's purpose. It is to be sharing the damn framework with as many people as possible in as many ways as possible. Knowing all of those things, And getting so grounded in them helps me overcome that fear of what will other people think? What happens if I fail? What happens if it's like, no, if I know on the days when I get frustrated because the business isn't doing what I want it to, I go back to my damn manifesto and that grounds me and it helps me make the decisions in how to move forward. 
I do this thing. <laughs> and it's worked for me. All this stuff takes time, though, yes. people. There's no, like, it's a magic pill. Is I'm a huge Mel Robbins fan. I think she's quirky and fun, and she's just so authentic. <laughs> she makes me laugh every time. I like, giggle in an awesome way. But she had her book come out, The High Five Habit. And I'm like, how silly is this that I'd be high-fiving myself in a mirror amongst other things? But okay, let's give it a go. And I tried it for a week. I'm like, I want to up this. I'm going to change this. And I made it my own. And I think that's kind of a lesson in all this is like, take something and make it your own. And so instead of high-fiving myself, when I had those moments of showing up to the mirror, I was talking to the 18-year-old version of myself, explaining to her, life's going to be crap. There's going to be moments when you want to give up, but you just got to keep pushing through. Let me tell you, it gets better on the other side of all of this stuff. These little nuances in life are needed for you to become the person that you're supposed to be. And like all these things, like, and then I would look up to the sun or like sky and I'd pull my hands up and I'm like, what's the lesson in this? Or ask the question, like, show me the way or thank you, thank you, thank you for this abundance. The more that I did that, if you believe in energetics and frequencies and putting things out into the universe, the universe, like Gabby Bernstein, always has your back. And it just whiplashes it back somehow in some way and you don't have to figure it out. And it is what it is. And it's that clarity too that helps the universe like know what you want. Exactly. It's like, tell me. It's like pitching. Yeah. It's like, don't just be so bad. What is it that you want? Yeah. Tell me right well, now. And, and it's something that I draw this distinction a lot when we're talking about the day of manifesto is it is your yes and your why. It is not your how. So when I first started and I was like, I'm going to share the take the damn chance. Well, first of all, it was called the take the damn trip movement because that's what I had said. And then people thought I was a vacation planner. So we shifted it. <laughs> but that's why when I first started, I was like, I'm going to share the take the damn trip movement through courses and this. And when I was like, this doesn't feel right. I said, I'm going to share the damn framework with as many people as possible in as many ways as possible. That's why I'm on your podcast. It's why I do keynote speaking. It's why I wrote the book. It's why I have my own podcast. It is just getting it out there in as many ways as possible. And then my why, the second half of my manifesto is in order to create a sustainable, thriving business that both supports and inspires my family and the world. Because it's not about just making enough money to pay for my kids' gymnastics lessons. It's about my kids came and walked on stage at the end of my TEDx talk. I wanted to inspire them to see me on stage. I wanted them to know that, yes, my son says that what I do for work is I do calls. <laughs> yes, I do calls. <laughs> but I also pick him up from school and I go to have lunch with my daughter at her first grade class. And so I want to inspire them as much as I want to support them. I love that. To give them a little taste. My son, Max, he's now 11. But at the time of the story, he was 10. My husband got his first plaque from YouTube. He got 100,000 subscribers. And Max is really inspired watching us do all this stuff. But he's really inspired by Dan. <laughs> and he turned to Dan one day and he's like, you know what? I'm going to beat Mama. He calls me Mama. I'm going to beat Mama's YouTube subscribers guys, I have like 240 subscribers because I'm not really on YouTube. I did for like a couple months and then it just, it wasn't what I needed to do at the time. So my husband got 100,000 and he's like, Max, I don't understand why you're going for that. You should be going for like Mr. Beast or something. And I said, how about you start with beating Dita? Because they call my husband Dita. And then he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now he has 2,400, 2,500 subscribers his YouTube shorts gets four or five, 10,000 views. He gets hundreds of comments. Good for him. Yeah. He went up when I got to pull this up. Again, I remind me, Joel, to add this to promotions. But he made a three-day YouTube plaque for him when he got his first 1,000 subscribers. Good for him. And it is the cutest thing ever. And he has it in his little bedroom because and he looks at it every day. So yes, bringing your kids out on stage is going to inspire them because they're like, oh, if my mom can do this, I can do this too. And that's really the lesson that you're teaching, I'm teaching the world is like, you got to just take the action, which leads me to the next question for you, is you emphasize action over mindset in your approach. So can you elaborate on why you believe taking action is more critical than having the right mindset? So I call this movement over mindset. And in all things, movement is more important than mindset. And the reason is, if you are waiting until your mindset is right or perfect, you will be standing in the same place in a year. 
because we can never control all of our thoughts. Is it easier to take action when we have a positive mindset? Of course it is. But what I want people to know is you don't have to wait until it's right in order to take action. So a lot of times we wait to get inspired in order to get into action. But the truth is we get into action to get inspired. So I like the analogy I use because people can remember what this was like. Do you remember those like metal death trap merry-go-rounds that were on playgrounds? And oh, we were yeah. Kids? Those are those are the ones where you don't stick your tongue to those in the winter time because it'll get stuck on. I remember those. Well, don't ever <laughs> stick it because it's rusted and you will need a tetanus shot and all those things. Well, if you think about those, when we would go out in the, at recess, everybody would grab a handlebar and you would lean into it because the hardest place to start was at the beginning because it was standing still. But you leaned into it. You took those first steps. These are your micro actions. And the first ones were harder, but then they got easier. They came faster. And then you jumped on and you spun and spun and spun. And it like, when I talk about this now, it makes me want to throw up. (laughs) But when you wanted to give a little boost to it, you just stuck your little foot out and you gave it a push. You didn't have to start back from standing still unless you wanted to. Now, the key about this, the movement over mindset is that those kids didn't wait till it was fun to get started. They got started and had faith that the fun would come. And the most fun in all of this is when you get off and you can't walk in a straight line. <laughs> and you're dizzy, exactly. <laughs> and you're going exactly. Like, like a little drunken sailor, exactly. <laughs> oh my God. I love watching kids at the park, like, watch, watch, there he goes. And he's like, Mah. Yeah, my son rolled down our hill in our backyard and he got up and he like immediately fell over. And then he got up like, okay, I can do this. And he fell into the woods and I'm just dying laughing. <laughs> like, me. Yeah. Like they're like heavy on one side. Exactly. But that's I why, I mean, we friends. have to think about that is like, we can't wait until it's fun. We can't wait till I only have positive thoughts. You have to know that whatever happens, you will be able to navigate it. I have a saying that I've been saying over and over and over again for the last two weeks, which is so relevant to this. And I'm writing this down is one day or day one. Yes. Because we wait for the perfect day one, which never, ever happens. It's like, I'm starting, I'm doing this thing now called 25 Hard-ish. Have you heard of the program 75 Hard? I've heard of this 25 Hard-ish too. I've heard people talking about. The 75 Hard I've done, and we did phase one, and it was a lot. It was hard. (laughs) Yeah, it it, it was a lot. Big significant change for me. However, I'm on this challenge now because we're going to the F1 race in Vegas. And I was like, hey, listen, this is a perfect amount of time for me to do something at 100% capacity, but it can't be 75 hard because I don't have time in my day to do two workouts and all these things. But what can I do? Let's make this easy for me to be sustainable yet achievable. I created my own list of things I have to do. And day one, I didn't check off everything. So like with 75 hard, if you're, if you miss something, you have to start over again. Well, I didn't want, because I would go to bed with so much anxiety thinking, oh my God, did I drink my water? Did I read my pages? Like, did I take my progress pictures? I don't want to fail because I don't want to start over again. Because I'm the (laughs) kind of person when I commit to something, I complete it. So with this one, the only, I guess, punishment is you have to take a five minute cold shower. And I was like, puff, doable. But I actually don't like doing that. So I made the list and it's like, it's still pretty a lot. It's like three liters of water, 10 pages of a book, one 45 minute workout. You have to sweat, 100 sit-ups and follow a diet, no alcohol, no sugar. And it's like, I'm on day four. It's easy. However, the point of this saying is my first day, I missed the workout because we were traveling. And so my punishment was the shower, done. However, I didn't stop and start over again. I kept going. And the next day was better. The next day is better. And it's like, you build this consistency. And so I always say, you say movement over mindset. And I love that. I say consistency is your currency. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just you're doing it. Micro movements, micro actions every single day. And I love that the day one versus one day, because that is why I say there will never be a perfect day. So why not today? Why not today to, you know, if you have your day of manifesto, so you know your yes, you know the thing that you want to create, then you take 15 minutes of micro action towards it every day. Because what happens when you talk about 75 hard or you talk about starting a business or you talk about it, speaking on stages, whatever it is, that's the top of the mountain. 
And if you are at the bottom looking at the top of the mountain, it can feel so far away. Why even start? It's like, oh, I'll never get there. I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to start now because it's going to take me too long. Instead, you just look at that first tree and that's the micro action. I'm just going to take the first tree. It's the smallest possible action that you will actually take. And then go to the next tree and the next tree. And you can climb an entire mountain going tree to tree to tree to tree to tree all the way up. And part of this too just reminded me of in understanding that it allows us to explore the journey is more important than the destination because we're like, oh, we got to get to the top of the mountain. Oh my gosh, look at that. It's all the way up there and it's cold and it's windy. Just got to fight. But how about just that first step, that first ridge, that next half a kilometer? And like, and if that's as far as you get, then guess what? That's as far as you got. But if you're already out there, you may as well commit. <laughs> you may as well do it. And you know, it's funny because people will ask me when you said earlier, how do we overcome this fear of like not going after the big thing, right? How do we get started anyway? So the best advice I ever got, I was 13, so it stood the test of time, (laughs) was from my dad. And I was trying to decide whether to go to boarding school or not because I'd gotten a full ride scholarship offer. And after like a three hour dinner, he said to me, you know, Bevan, you're going to make the best decision that you can with the information that you have at hand. And if in six months or six weeks or even six days, you make a different decision, it's not because this one is wrong. It's because you have more information and you're making the best decision you can with the information that you have. I don't think any of us are out there trying to make bad decisions or, you know, trying to fail at something but we're doing what we can with the information we have. And like you said, you get to this tree and you're like, this is as far as I can go. That's not because you went up the wrong path. It's because you have more information and now this other path is where you should go. It's just a change in direction. Yeah, my my husband and I used to argue about these things and I'd be like, but you told me that you liked peanut butter and all of a sudden today you don't. And by the way, he loves peanut butter. This is an example. (laughs) But his response would always be like, oh, new information. And he explained that to me once and that's all I had to know. So now it's like, whenever I say, but you said we were doing this and he's like, oh, new information. And that, and that's all I needed to know that this decision was changed because of something else he learned that he didn't know about, which I think makes you a more well-rounded human. <laughs> that you're willing to take that information in. It has eliminated so much regret and fear of failure to me to know that I'm just doing the best I can with what I have right now and I'll get more and or I'll get different information and then I'll continue to just do the best I can. I love it. Okay, I have one more question for you. Okay. When I ask you what it means to be a wild woman, what is that to you? I think that a wild woman, what it means to me is to be fully committed to my authentic self, which again, like we said, will kind of change. But it means that there are times where I say, Hey, I I texted my nanny the other day and I said, hey, just so you know, when the kids tell you that they can have ice cream for breakfast, they're not lying. And she was like, okay. And when she got to work the next day, I said, I made, I screwed up. We always do Sundays on Sunday. I totally forgot. We didn't have ice cream. They remembered at bedtime. And my choice was I can break down at bedtime and that will just derail everything. Or I can say, you can have ice cream with your cereal because it's just like milk. (laughs) And so that's what they did. But to me, it was like, that was me not being concerned about what is society or my nanny or my mom going to say about this, but what is the best decision for me and my kids in this moment? And that can seem really wild to people at times, but it is really real for us. And what a better time to feed your kids sugar is before the school. And I'll yeah, go away. Else's responsibility. <laughs> yeah, Remember, you don't you don't swear, but go away. <laughs> yeah, go away. And really, it is the best time of day to be eating that stuff. So now I think we're going to change the rules around here too. My husband in the summertime used to always bring them for ice cream after a day of boating right before we go home to go to bed. And I go, it's on you. If they come, nope, everything's on you from the next 12 hours because you made this decision. I love it. Okay, Bevan, if people want to go online to find you, where can they go? 
In all things, I am Bevan Farange. So Instagram, my website is bevanfarange.com. Like you mentioned, I do have a podcast called All the Damn Things. And this is where we explore how these frameworks fit into all the different areas of our lives. And again, from my website, you can also find my book and just all the things I'm up to. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. So there you have it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Into the Wild. To make this girl happy and to help reach other women who are dreaming of starting their business, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes and everywhere you listen in. Also, if you want to find me in the wild, check me out on Instagram at Renee underscore Warren. That's R-E-N-E-E underscore W-A-R-R-E-N. And leaving you with one of my favorite tips of all time, the best advice you could ever receive is from someone who has successfully done it before you. Until next time, ladies, peace out. <laughs>